Hello, everyone, and welcome. Last year, I became enraptured by a social media post that seemed as if I could have come out of my, it could have come out of my couple's therapy sessions, you know, and uh, here was the story. It was a middle-aged pilot that announced, I'm sad to share that I'm ending my marriage. And she pushed me too far this time. I won't let my company force me to get the vaccine. Why would I let my wife? And comments began to flood in from everywhere. I mean, hundreds of them. You know, good for you. Stand your ground to Ali. Come on, just get the jab. It's not worth to put your kids through all of this. Earnestly, he responded to hundreds of comments, each time giving more context. And to my mind, it was full blown crowdsourced therapy. You know, he was a career pilot and he had been laid off because, in his words, he didn't want a corporation telling him what to do with his body. And the more they pushed and the more he dug in. And his wife, she was a career nurse in an emergency room that was hard hit by COVID-19. And she was now threatening to kick him out. More comments kept coming in. Think about how many people she has seen die only to come home to a stubborn husband who won't acknowledge her reality. And in his responses, he's sad, he loves her. He tells the story of how they met in an emergency room where she took care of him for an illness that he had let go untreated. And he shares how they fell in love. And this too was part of how their story may end. But my question was, is it? So we'll come back to this. But before, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me at Letters from Esther, my live monthly workshop series that will help you reflect, act, and develop greater confidence and relational intelligence in all of your relationships. This series happens monthly on YouTube and Facebook Live. For more Letters from Esther Perel, I invite you to just go to estherperel.com slash blog. And I invite you to join every month here on YouTube or on Facebook to discuss the newsletter live. So we read it and then we come together and we discuss it. It's like a little workshop together every time, you know. Before we start, just think, who should be here today that you know and let them know very quickly? Um, who else has had all kinds of issues about values and impasses related to big differences of opinions in this domain, values clarification. And of course, I always encourage you to take notes in your little book, on your phone, whatever you do, but just write it down because we think we will remember and we don't. Not to the extent that we do when it's written in front of us. You know, that log that you will keep from month to month, you will see your own progression as you develop your own relational intelligence. And if you like what you learned today, like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's growing fast and with you it could grow faster. So I'm going to ask this, can you relate? That is the title question of what I'm going to be telling you right now. Because I really want to know if you can relate to the dilemma that I was just describing. Are there any topics about which you and your partner or past partner or friends and family, for that matter, have fought about or fought over and over again? Share with me in the chat. I actually want to know what has some of these impossible conversations, you know? Um, what are some of these big, hot topics that you have been debating with your loved ones? If you really want to read the whole story about the pilot and the nurse that I was sharing, just go to estherperel.com slash blog. It was my most recent newsletter. I was riveted by this story. And I was more riveted by what people were saying, you know, not just what this couple was having an argument about. So... Are you telling me misogyny, religion, and money, diets for our children? Yes, vaccination, Daniel, uh, denying responsibility, Razan, to me is dishonesty, red flag, and my partner doesn't. Yes, clashes on having a regular job, Nadine van Brederode. Um, yes, we fight about his kids. 
Justine, Sarah, we debate how my husband should be taking a pop. He went too far, too fast. Going high versus stooping to their level. Yes. Um, David Newman, religious and conservative, and I am not. Um, yes. Feminism, Alexandra, and traditional families, COVID vaccination. Okay, we're on target. We're totally on topic right here, you know. Um, the responses that I got, of I thought they got, this pilot and the nurse got on social, actually really held the line very much, you know, both sides of the debate. I heard from people that deeply related to the pilot and others that deeply related to the nurse. And I'd love to hear from you if you find yourself rather viscerally leaning more to one side or the other. That in itself would be very telling as well, you know. Um, yeah, Anthony, you fight about commitment. My partner and I share values. The stage where his values should apply to everyone, Justine. Jam, responsibility. Jonathan, time management. Amy, nurse. You identify with the nurse, yes, yes. And then your values, house cleaning, parenting, religion, abortion, Gail. Uh, how to talk to teenagers about abortion, yes, Gail. We're planning to marry next July. That was a name in written in a language that I cannot read. Would it be Greek? I have a feeling this could be Greek. Um, yes, you identify with the nurse, the nurse. Uh, boundaries in an open relationship, Iman. Yep, yep. NRA, Venisa, politics, opening the relationship or not. Nadine van Brederode again, yes. Okay, living together or not. Yep. So you see... I'm going to do a little spoiler alert here, but the couple wasn't just fighting about the vaccine. They were debating two different social, political, and psychological worlds. So I want to open this up for a minute, because when you are focused on a topic, you become kind of laser, but the laser focus doesn't mean necessarily laser sharp. It actually works in the opposite direction. You know, the vaccine debate may have died down somewhat, and it gives us a chance to actually analyze how it played out among couples. And that's helpful because the polarization that I see in many of the couples that I'm working with has shifted to other issues, abortion, climate change, gun control. But then, yes, all the other values that you are talking about, having to do with money, having to do with family, having to do with boundaries, having to do with religion. You know, these issues are very real and very personal, but they also are vessels for other emotions. Hot topics are hot buttons. They sharpen the polarization. They push us into court corners. And when that button is pushed, we become more extreme. Our fights become more divisive. They can unravel and get out of control. We're upset. We're frustrated. And it leaves us feeling sometimes that not only has the world that we live in gone mad, but the person I'm living with, I can no longer recognize. It's like, you know, when it unravels, like, how the mm, can you think this way? Or what am I doing here? It's as if suddenly we see the other person only through the lens of this one aspect. And that is problematic and inaccurate and inaccurate. So next step, the fights will arise and create deep divisiveness that will cause seemingly unresolvable impasses and relationship standoffs. But I, I want to emphasize the word also seemingly because when you hone in on the and you focus on the subject at hand, we leave out the core values underneath that this subject is an expression of. And that is where I think we need to go. So let's go deeper for a moment. Because as you say right here, you know, um, Johannel, for, for example, you know, unclear values, kind of like foggy thoughts, not knowing where to start you know, or morning collage, living together or not, or Chiara, you know, sticking to Corona rules together or not. You know, I like the or not here on, you know, a lot of the things that you're talking about. Or Charles, you just clash over trivial issues. But the question is, you know, they will be trivial if you think that the thing you're clashing about is what you're actually clashing about. They won't be trivial if you go underneath. 
you have always, this is what we are developing as part of relational intelligence, is this going underneath. So should we spend the holidays with your parents or mine? If you keep it as a trivial issue, you don't see that the underlying value, the bigger question is, what is the place of parents or extended family in a couple? What are the boundaries? What are the duties, the obligations? What do we owe them? You know, if we share finances, do we need to ask permission for personal spending? What is the value underneath? What is the degree of togetherness or separateness in our relationship? You know, in this instance related to finances, but it could also be as in I'm going out with a friend of my own or I'm taking a trip on my own. What do I get to do alone? What do I do alone unilaterally? What do I need to discuss with you? What do I get to just do offhand? And where do I need permission? You know, where do we come together and where do we have autonomy? That's the value. Why do I have to pick up your dishes or your socks, for God's sakes? You know, and the value discussion is about gender roles and about expectations and about responsibilities. I have to stay late at work. Can't you understand that? And the value is the value discussion here, the value clarification. Is money more important or time? Which is the bigger contribution, value contribution in our relationship? I want my kid baptized, circumcised. I want a big church wedding. I want a pure relationship until we marry. All of these statements are about different cultural legacies and the traditions there within. You go for the core value. I used to hear a lot of these stories in my office, but the clashes around social values within couples, families, or colleagues and friends, I think they have taken up a whole new fever pitch, you know. Long-standing patterns in our relationships are really coming to a head around these arguments, you know. If you listen closely to a screaming couple, you will hear feelings around respect, recognition, control, trust, care, power, this is what is stirring up and what is intensifying the fire. You know, it's not the subject at hand. And you may be wondering, how does it get so intense in the first place? Partly it's because old vulnerabilities, or not old, are vulnerabilities actually, totally present ones too. And insecurities come to the front in some ways at times, we're all stuck in our childhood bedroom while we are in a current stalemate, you know. But the problem is different. So what is happening in my childhood that I don't feel that people take me seriously, that they don't take my opinion, you know, that they think that, you know, they're smart and I'm dumb, that I, don't, I can't get people to listen to me. I mean, these old remnants from our childhood are right here in the clash over our values, but I think that I had an example yesterday that was very, very powerful. So it's a, a couple that I'm going to be releasing very soon. They are separated by war. One of them lives in the country of the war, and one of them is with each person, by the way, with one child. And if you ask her what drew you to him, she will say, his character, his integrity, his values, his way of, of ability to think about things bigger than himself. What are they fighting about now? The fact that he stayed behind and that he, first of all, stayed behind because he can't leave, but also stayed behind with a sense of duty to the country and to the nation. And what would she have wanted was for him to be there with her. They both miss each other deeply, but they end up not talking about how they miss each other. They end up talking about why is he staying there and why doesn't she understand what it means for him to stay there. When in fact, this is exactly the core values that drew her to him in the first place. So there is the overt situational issue that seems to be about different values, but then there is the core values underneath. And often the very thing that you're arguing about, that you disagree with in the moment, is rooted in the same values that originally drew you to your partner. It's very important. The very thing that you now are arguing about, 
why do you always think about others before you think about you is something that you probably used to say when you thought about the beautiful parts of your partner too. Why are you so devoted to the community and not to me? Or why are you, you know, it's, it's kind of what is taking you away from me now that I used to think was actually a beautiful thing because I used to be the, away from the others at the time that it started. So... What are a few things that I see people do a lot and that I think really uh, need to shift if you want to get out of these stalemates, you know? You step away from the content of the argument for a moment. You know, it's not about, you know, the, the party, the holidays, the money the, in the moment, right? You consider the form. And the form is this. How are we having a conversation? Not what are we discussing, but how are we talking about this? Yeah. Are we being respectful? Can we hear each other? Can we be curious about why the other person sees things the way they do? You know, when he says, I need to be here, I need to serve other people. You know, I have a duty, I have a responsibility. And she says, but what about us? You know, that's a, that was really the gut-wrenching thing because they both believed in us and they both believed in the others. It wasn't nearly as polarized as what they made it out to be. So, you know, how, are you listening? Are you curious? That's the first one, you know. Um, are you even empathic on some level to the point of view of the other person? The thing not to do is name calling, you know. I can't believe what kind of a person are you that you would be thinking, this is the nice versions of name calling, right? Don't lump your partner with their parents suddenly, you know. Your whole family is a bunch of nut jobs, you know. Conservative nut jobs, liberal nut jobs, libertarian nut jobs, you know, nut jobs. You know, it's like suddenly I put you with all these other people that I don't like. Eee, bad thing to do, really not. Not a, good, not a good option, you know. Because you're basically saying you're in a different tribe than me. I can't even relate to you, you know. Um, have you already decided how they think? You kind of make a bunch of assumptions and you don't even bother asking questions anymore. And then consider if you're trying to win at home because you feel out of control elsewhere. Like, I can't convince my boss. I at least would like to know that I can convince my partner. And then most importantly, I think this is one of the things that I find most useful, is when you ask people, is there another potential clash of values, another area of these kinds of values differences where you actually don't fight or clash over, you know? It's very interesting. You may be fighting over money, but you don't fight over how much time to spend with your respective family. You fight over respective family time, but you've never had an issue around money or around how much one can be away when it's about work. So pick an area where you don't fight and ask yourself, how do we handle it there? What is it that we do in that area that actually works well for us? It's really useful to look at another topic that isn't an issue for you, but often can create World War III for somebody else. And to see what allows you with this other subject to find understanding and a modus vivendi. And then glean the information from that area that is conflict-free and see what you can apply to the area where you get completely into an impasse. You know, we fight over money, but not over religious issues. We fight over gender role issues, but not over money. You know, this kind of. So find an open window that you can enter to see what are the riches there that help you, that allow you to be harmonious with each other or to be differentiated from each other or to be understanding of the difference and respectful of the difference between the two of you and then bring it over to the area that is much more difficult, you know. So I'm going to see a little bit what you're telling me here. Adriana, what about with a husband that is no longer convinced about our faith and I still have teens who look up at us. Yes, the differences when one person's belief system, the religious orientation is shifting. But that's what I'm living through right now, says Linda. I decided that it's okay not to be okay. Jamie, um, listen, okay, what is your question? Deeply, you know, husband has been traumatized as a child by things that his father did to him. Estrangement in families from political combat. Yes, Melo. Um, 
very triggered by the word Trump. Yes, Jam. Um, interested in individual, yeah, that's a different thing. So, first piece is go and get help, get input from your own positive areas of values clarification for the complicated ones. And now, you know, what I mean by the core values, the very thing, I'm going to say it for the third time because I want this to sink in, the very thing that you may be arguing about on the values front, why you spend so much money here, you may have told me earlier that you find your partner very generous. That very same generosity is what is now taking your partner to want to give money to something that you may not agree with. You may find that your partner is too much people pleasing. The very thing that you are now criticizing, you pay too much attention to what other people think about you, is what you once welcomed when it was your opinion that they welcomed. So the thing you're fighting is rooted in the same core values that you once really admired or respected. And when I say once, it means on another issue the same day. It's not like the past versus now. But I want to make you do a little exercise, you know, before we move into the Q&A, which I'm inviting you to begin to write your questions to us, but also take a moment just to practice what I am talking about. I'm going to give you all some advice and questions to bring to each other the next time you find yourself fighting with a loved one about values. On a day-to-day -day basis, prioritize common ground. Because when you fight over values, in the moment, it looks like that person represents just this one thing. And you no longer see that they have a host. This is a much broader per context. The person is much more than just this. But in the moment, this is all you hear, is their views about guns, their views about abortion, about religion, about money, etc. In the heat of the moment, take a break. Cool down. You know, just basically say, this is not helpful. This is not a useful conversation. We need to stop rather than drilling into the other, right? When you're ready to talk, see if you can be curious. I just want to understand why you think that this invasion, you know, should take place. Why you think that this person should be deposed. Why you think that this was a good thing to do. Why you think this was a wrong thing to do. And these are the real questions, right? When you So ask questions. The very interesting question for me is, how did you come to think this way? So in the couple that I was describing, you know, he says at one point, you know, I was told that I am a man of action and I am here to do things and to do things, you know, for the good of the world, the country, the rest, my family. I am not here to just take care of my feelings. And the difference of value was a difference between what seemed to be the focus on feelings and the focus on actions. But it came from very clear messages in the family. This was the role of men, and it was very gender-specific. Women were allowed to have feelings. Men had to have actions. And that left him very turbulent inside because when he would say, I'm scared, I'm lonely, I miss you, I, I, I am afraid of the bombs passing over my head, you know, it, it seemed like, I'm so sorry I'm being weak. The value was men is associated with stoicism, with action, with fearlessness. And all the other things would threaten that value system around a certain view of masculinity. That's values. You know, listen to the underlying fears. What is your loved one afraid to lose? I really hone into this thing. I value this thing. Goes along with I'm afraid to lose something if I don't. Ask them what are they afraid to lose? What is personal for them? Share with them your own fears. Tell them how you came to think the way you do and what you are afraid to lose and why this is personal to you. And ask each other, what does just and, a just and safe world look like to each person? Because these issues are about bigger things than just my little universe. And can we disagree and still respect each other? Or do we need to take space? You know, when I worked 
with interreligious couples. And remember, one of the very important findings was that two people from different religions that share similar views of religiosity often have more value connection and value similarity than two people who come from the same religion, but one person is more secular and one person more traditional. Meaning that the value orientation brings more communality among the two people than the nominal religion that both people may be part of. And this is true, you will notice this around child rearing practices, around gender roles, around religious beliefs. This piece is essential and it's essential for living together and values here become much more important than just feelings or actions for that matter, even though both of them are wrapped around values as well. So I want to start the Q&A and um, I'm going to let the questions come up so that we can begin a conversation together, because I think we have a ton of stuff here to clarify and to talk about with each other. How can I stop myself from getting blinded by anger when we fight about our values? I mean, when we get blinded by anger when we fight about our values, one, there's a lot of things going on, right? This is a Lovena, right? So, no, Lorena, pardon, Lorena. Um, Here's the thing. Why do you need your partner to agree with you? Why do you need to feel that you are completely aligned on that thing? Or you, you know, it's like either we are one, we're one unit, we think alike, or we are in massive meltdown because we can't really tolerate the difference. You know, so that's the first question for you is what is it that you are reacting to? Not what do you think about what your partner says? What is creating that kind of agitation inside of you? How can you think this way means what? That you don't care about me? That you don't value what I do? What's the underneath? And you didn't say which values you're arguing about. So the, when you say, you know, blinded by anger, it means like you're losing it. You, you no longer can see anything. So then you have to ask yourself, what is, what is being jolted inside of me? What is this doing to me that you think this way? And own it and take responsibility over it. It's, there, is, there may be not much wrong with what your partner is thinking, but more how you interpret it. If you think this way, this means X, Y, Z for me, and that makes me feel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the line you go down for what you how you can stop yourself. You will stop yourself when you know what you are reacting to, what is happening inside of you. So your own self-awareness will help you with your blinding anger. Can we get the letters a little bit bigger, by the way, so that I can really get the names correct? How about reaching a partner to soften their hand lines, their political views, their hard lines? as a result of past war survivor trauma, so they can hear a different opinion without personalizing it. So you want to reach your partner whose political, you know, who, their hard lines, that you consider those hard lines, right? Because of what they went through, you, they have very set positions and you would like them to be able to consider a different position, but they can't do it because their personal experience sits in the middle. This is, so the issue is this, sometimes the personal experience is such that I am not prepared to see the goodness of my government <laughs> who put my parents in jail. It's that kind of situation. I don't know if that's what you are referring to, but I, this is where I'm going, right? It's like, no, it's very, very difficult and it takes years to be able to separate what happened to me or to my family and you know, see the other entity in more neutral terms. What you can say is because I don't have a personal experience, I am able to see something else. I'm able to understand why these policies were put in place or I can see what your parents or, rep or your brother or friend, whoever represented and why they were detained or silenced or, um, but Generally, I think that when the personal experience has been so wounding, exile, fleeing, jailing, 
you know, and things that create hard oppressions of all sorts that create these very personalized positions, what is important is to recognize that. Just the actual acknowledgement that this distinction becomes much harder to do. And that is a dis distinction that your partner has to be able to own. I can't see it differently because of what I went through. But I understand that you did not go through this and therefore you will see things differently. The problem becomes if I want you to see it like me as if you had gone through it when you haven't. See, it's the, syncre it's the syncretism. It's the idea, it's the, the desire to create a one unit as if we are one and the same person that becomes really problematic rather than the ability to tolerate different worldviews in the same room at the same time with somebody who is very close to us. Yes. Alexis, he always tries to use rationality and logic as an excuse for advancing his opinion, something he used to value, but he now weaponized. How can I address that? It's a great question. <sighs> Because, the, of course, the idea is like, you know, straight from Descartes that rationality and logic is the only source of knowledge. And there are many sources of knowledge. You see, the thing is that it's not about the, the, what he's trying, it's not about the position he's trying to advance. It's the fact that he actually thinks there's superiority to rationality and logic, that that is more superior to intuition, to other forms of knowledge, to, to other sources of data, for that matter to more artistic, aesthetic appreciations of things. So um, you basically have to, the challenge is, um, it's so interesting how much you held, hold yourself together and how much you try to boost your argument by talking, by thinking that rationality and logic give it heft. And, uh, and then the question is, you know, has your partner other sources of knowledge in other moments? Or is this, the typical thing, you know, you don't understand because you don't think clear because you don't see the connection between this and this because you don't. <laughs> I wouldn't have an argument. I would just simply say it's very interesting to listen to you try to make yourself more confident than you maybe are by trying to put stuff together in such a way that I have nothing to answer. You know, some conversations are set up in such a way that basically instead of having an argument, you probably should say there is no conversation, there's no conversation invitation here at this moment. Why am I having this, why am I having this discussion? You are basically not interested in a conversation, interested in convincing me, clobbering me, you know, whatever it is, but not in a conversation. So before you go into your values clarification, examine the frame. Is there a conversation here or is there a fight? I'm not interested in a fight. I would love to have a conversation about this. An end of discussion for the moment. Zuleka, as a practicing Muslim, how can I connect with my agnostic partner and create significance for him around my practices? where he can be present and find value, even if he doesn't practice in the same way. Um, sometimes I will join you in a practice because you are important to me, not the practice. And I'm happy to be there for you. And you are there to say, thank you, that means a lot. The fact that I matter to you is very beautiful to me. And so instead of wanting him to see the beauty of what you do, he sees the beauty of you. And I think that that is undervalued, that that actually has been the reason for many people to do things. I'll go with you to church because it's important to you. If I wasn't with you, I wouldn't step a foot in there. I'll go with you to the mosque. I'll go, I'll, I will do Ramadan with you. I won't eat certain hours because you're not eating. I do it out of respect for you, but not because it matters to me. And if we were not together, this would not be in my life. And the issue is, but you are together and therefore it is in my life because of you. Now, you ask him, what are the things that, that we do that you find more appealing than others, you know? Or you say, there are certain things for which your presence means a great deal to me because I enjoy doing having you by my side, because I don't really want to do these things alone, because it creates a certain unity in our family, because it reminds me of the tradition in my own home. You own your reasons. You don't try to convince your partner that these need to be their reasons. They have their reasons, 
but they will do it out of respect for yours. It's a different modality here. You see, they don't have to believe. They don't have to, they, and it has to be very clear. Without you, they would do none of it. They do it because they're with you. And that is the ground from which they swell. These are amazing questions, people. It's like, this is like we're in the meat, <laughs> in the heart of the matter. Mina, how do you manage your partner's young adult kids when they are messy with no social skills? If they lost their mom when they were young and he doesn't see or want to discipline them. This is, a, this is actually not about values. I think this is a different question. But it's a beautiful question. Because what happens here is they lost their mom. I feel for them. I feel sorry for them. I feel guilty for them. I feel sad for them. And as a result, I didn't want to make their life hard. I wanted to be kind to them. They suffered so much. This notion of they suffered so much, parents to children, children to parents, and therefore I did not ask from them certain things that actually would even be good for them, that are part of child rearing. So the first thing is the conversation between you and your partner. And that means to say, I this maybe, you know, instead of you don't you let them get away with murder, look what a mess they are, you never put your foot down, they turn you around their finger and all of this, which basically is you're an incompetent, you're an incompetent, you're an incompetent. And your kids are unbearable. You know, it's I can see why this may have been so hard for you to be both the disciplinarian and the loving person. I can see that having suffered at the loss of their mother, it was hard for you to, or I can see that that was the role she took and you were never very good at this because of whatever else is in your life. And so when she died, you didn't step into those shoes. You know, do you see that sometimes big doubt? The value difference may be that your partner may think that his kids are not nearly that sloppy and that they actually behave quite well and that you are way too strict. Now we're in value land. So then the thing is, do we have a shared view of our expectations of your children? You know, I don't know if you live together or not. Do we have a shared values about how we want our home to be? And again, it wouldn't be the home he would live in if he was without you. And it wouldn't be the home you would live him if you were without him. Yours may be more tidy. His may be more messy. We become different because we adapt to the person we live with, not because we have changed our values, but because we have adapted to the values of the person that we are with. That's a very big distinction. And the day we've split, we often go back exactly to what we always wanted. Sometimes we took a few things with us, we exported, and we said, I thought from, I learned from my partner to do this and this differently, and it's become a part of me. But on many things, we go back to being the person we were, but we lived in a foreign country and therefore we acted, you know, like they do in Rome. When I'm with you, I become more attentive to, you know, my messy children without social skills. You know, do you think it is important for people in general to be polite, to be courteous, to say, please, thank you, you know, to clean up after them and all of that as a broad thing? Is that something that we want to bring together in our house? That's the, that is the sequence that I would do in this area. Yes, Tosin, we're both Christian, but she's pro-choice and I am pro-life. How can we move forward in a healthy way? Huh? Well, maybe we begin by changing the language, pro-choice and pro-life. Has that really been helpful lately? And in a couple, does that help the conversation? Or, you know, is there somebody here who is not pro-life in the broad sense of the word? So the thing is really, you know... Um, as long as you don't have a decision to make about this in visceral in the in the moment you know this is a rather intellectual conversation right so it's like how did you come to think this way this is what i said before how did you come to think this way what do you fear you would lose if you didn't hold to this view you know what are the values you're trying to hold up when you present the the, the the, your, your ideas the way you do? What is it that you're trying to hold up? What are you being loyal to? What are the core values behind this? You know, is it, you know, there's certain things that a person doesn't have a choice about. It's not my choice to decide if this fetus should live or not. There is a bigger force out there that makes those decisions versus I actually think that the big questions are in the hands of the individual. That's 
what often lies behind this as well. You know, what are the things that we get to make a decision about? Or is there a God or is there nature or are there bigger forces that make those decisions for us? You know, about who shall live and who shall die or when do we consider something living or not living and all of that. There is not a right and wrong here. Just be very clear. There's no right and wrong in the answer. There's two very different views some, on some level, socially, politically, religiously, and existentially about big, you know, um, ethical questions, metaphysical questions. <laughs> so um, she emphasizes different things, you emphasize different things. It's that conversation. And if you can hold that conversation, you have a healthy relationship. You know, people have lived in homes where one person was deeply religious and the other one not, or when one, but, you know, people have lived because they share a lot of other things. To share a lot, a lot of other things. One person being, you know, for the death penalty and the other person just can't conceive of it. But they have a whole life and many, many other values. And again, the very values that support one person being, you know, in favor of a free choice towards the termination of pregnancy are the values that you may actually really appreciate in other areas of your life, but you don't like them when they apply to this particular topic. So it's the ability to contain this conversation and the tension around it that makes your relationship healthy. It's not a resolution. That's it. I think that we are going to stop right here. I mean, people, this would be a whole day seminar. It's just beyond rich. So thank you, everyone, for attending this month's workshop. And you can learn more about the monthly newsletter and the workshops by going to the letters from Esther on my website, dot com slash blog. Join me on YouTube every month. I see you right here. Bye-bye, everyone.